It's January 1st, 2020, and if you are listening to this show on New Year's Day, you are a crime after crime super fan. We love you. Hey, it's John Lorden. And me, Danielle Hallen. Happy New Year. I hope you guys had a great holiday, and I hope you're ready for today's episode. Yeah. New Year. You get to spend it with us. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Should we whisper? Is anyone hungover out there? <laughs> I know. Should, There's should no do, telling. We're going to do ASMR. Yes. <laughs> Probably me, so <laughs> at least whisper for me. <laughs> Future me needs this. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Crime After Crime. Uh, really happy to be in 2020. This is, we've only been doing Crime After Crime for less than two years, but it's kind of spanned over since 2018, yeah. all of 2019, and now into 2020. We're also entering a new decade, Danielle. Can you believe it? freaks me out. I can't handle it. I don't know what it is about it. Something about it. I saw, I hadn't even thought about it. And then I saw something online. I think it was like two months ago that was like two months left in this decade, make them count. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done everything I wanted to do in this decade yet. Wait a minute. Yeah. Well, on, on top of that, you're a mother and think yeah. of all the experiences that you're going to get to go through with your kids over these next 10 years. It's uh, going to be absolutely crazy. That's going to take you right to, uh, yeah, it'll get you right into high school, right? <gasps> yes. <laughs> yes, it will. I'm pretty sure it will. Yes, it will. Oh my yeah. goodness. That's crazy. That's even crazier to think about. And what's crazy is that I remember I actually graduated in 2010 from wow. high school. Wow. So, but it, that year didn't affect me. That change of decade, well, I didn't, I wasn't phased at all. Yeah. This time I'm like, whoa, I can't. Yeah. I can't handle it. That's pretty interesting to think about where you've come from in the past 10 yeah. years. Yeah. For me, even, yeah, I mean, it's interesting for me too. I used to live in California. I mean, I was in a totally different career path. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, like, I, I don't have kids. Um, I'm married to the same woman I was married to 10 years ago. So it's, 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 it's kind of cool that so much is the same, but there is also stuff that is different as you kind of change and get older. Yeah, I was about to say, that's an accomplishment in itself. That must be pretty cool to be able to look back and be like, wow. It is. It is. And it's also, there's something about it that's kind of weird because you'll remember dates or you'll hear about a date, you know, something will refer to like, oh, 2005. And you'll be like, yeah, wasn't that yesterday? Like, no, you were here. <laughs> <laughs> this woman on the couch next to me. Yeah, she was here. That was just yesterday, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is that's crazy oh yeah. my gosh yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome all right well uh if you guys want to vote on an episode of crime after crime you can do that by following our twitter account which is at crime after pod and you're able to vote there for seven days after the episode drops or you guys can also vote on the YouTube version as well. Just hover your mouse over the screen or put your finger if you're on a mobile device. A little eye will pop up in the corner and you can cast your vote there. So this is where we get to voting results with Danielle for last episode, which was the Santa Claus crimes. I thought that was a really fun episode and we had a couple of good stories. How did it shake out with the vote, Danielle? Oh my goodness, you guys. <laughs> this is crazy. On Twitter, I received 77% of the votes what? and John received 23%. What? Ouch. Wow. Congratulations. I, I don't even know what to say about that, honestly. But the thing is, is I told John beforehand, I was like, I'm warning you. She did. I found a good one. I it, saw this story. I've even considered covering it on my channel. I'm so intrigued by it. It is a great story. That's like the, was it Ma Baker? Is that the story I did about that, yeah. that crazy mom? Yeah. Every now and then oh you just goodness. hit this gem of a historical uh, story. And, and it's you, just so great. You pulled it out. Yeah. You absolutely earned that one. What about on YouTube? On YouTube, I received 82% of the votes and you received 17%. Whoa! That's insanity, you guys. That might be the biggest thumping yet. That might be the widest range that we've had in terms of numbers yet. I'll, I'll have I, to look. I feel like it had everything to do with the fact that police were offering people money to I shoot someone. I, <laughs> I genuinely yeah. believe that has a lot to do with it Although, because that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. There was a lot of people that also keyed into him um, gathering up the kids 
and like, you know, yeah. walking down the street with the kids. And mm -hmm. I mean, he really took advantage of that costume in quite, sure quite a different way. You know, my Santa was kind of, he was clever. He was quick. Oh yeah. Then oh, there yeah. was a little bit of fumbling and you find out this guy is really, you know, it, he really tries hard. He just doesn't always execute very well. <laughs> but yours was really, there was so much more to the story because it was about a community it was about a giant shootout. <laughs> uh, <laughs> things, things that I never thought we would be talking about. I was, yeah, yeah it, was, it was crazy. Giant shootout turns into car chase, turns into attempted hijacking, leaving the money in the other car. It just had so many elements. Someone needs to jump Wandering on that. Wandering in Texas for days. <laughs> yeah. Why isn't there a movie of that that I can watch? I know there's a book, yeah. but that's about it. Man. There's not a movie, but wow. that was, I know that's crazy. Thank you guys so much for voting for that. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you, and thank I you, needed it. <laughs> thank you, Danielle. Thank you for bringing that story. It's, it's, I, I've talked about this on the show before. It is no shame to be thumped when there is excellent storytelling like that going on. I'm so, telling you. Yeah. And I'll know, try to work it. harder, guys. Let me just put that out there. I'll, I'll try my best. You look, I don't want to hear it. The only time I bring stories like that is when you completely destroy me <laughs> the month before. And then I'm like, wait a minute. All right. I keep that in mind, guys. We, crazy. We, yeah, we, 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 we have to win, but we can't win by much. So we don't <laughs> anger Danielle again and make her pull out something like that. Uh, all right. How are we looking for season two? <clears throat> we are two for two right now. Mm. Uh, here we go again. Here we're we go back. Again. We're back on the same track. Yeah, yeah. I guess it wouldn't be crime after crime if it wasn't neck and neck. That's I know amazing. exactly. Uh, oh, is it that time? I have to give it up. Is. Can I give you a different cup instead? I've got I've got a Doctor Phil mug. Oh, absolutely not. No, you don't. Want after, <laughs> <laughs> I need the crime after crime mug, <laughs> and it's the holidays. You could fill it with eggnog, okay, or you could fill it with vodka, or I'll take right. anything. You ready? There you are. Take the crime after crime mug. But uh, if it tastes a little funny, it's because I didn't wash it before I sent it to you. So. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And don't don't keep any uh, keep it away from open flames. It might. <laughs> all right. Awesome. My, my kind of drink. Mm -hmm. um, all right, everyone. Well, it's time to get into today's topic. Um, which is an interesting one. This is kind of Very. different. I really don't know what to expect because when we pick our themes, they usually at least set us off in a certain direction. And our stories will sometimes have connections obvious to the theme. Yeah. Other times we just seem to be linked at the brain and we'll pick a similar type of story even within that theme. But this one, I really don't know what to expect. Today's topic is birth year crimes. And what we mean is our birth years. So it is 1975 versus 1992. Now, before we get to our stories, we thought we would take you guys in the time capsule with us and learn a little bit about those years and what made them so special. So starting with, the uh, the Elder, 1975, <laughs> Wheel of Fortune premiered on NBC. Oh, wow. Still running to this day. Saturday Night Live premiered on NBC. Also, What a good year. Yeah, great year for television, huh? <laughs> I know. Bill Gates started using a term for microcomputer software, and that term was Microsoft, which he would actually file a trademark on and become his company. The Vietnam War ended. Bruce Springsteen released Born to Run. Steven Spielberg's Jaws is released in theaters and becomes the world's first modern blockbuster. It literally oh, wow. changed. Yeah, it changed Hollywood and how those movies were released and how they became giant events. Uh, also that year, and I don't know if I can really call this a historical event, but Travis Walton was abducted by aliens. Rough year for him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, his story would become a book and also become a movie called Fire in the Sky. In 1975, we had a lot of celebrities that were born. Dax Shepard, uh, Tito Ortiz, MMA fighter, Drew Barrymore. Oh, love her. Yeah. Lauren Hill, <laughs> Angelina Jolie, Linda Cardellini, Tobey Maguire, who... Might be, well, the new Spider-Man's pretty good, but Toby's up there too. He's one of yeah. my favorite Spider-Mans. Yep, I agree with you. Uh, Jason Sudeikis, Tiger Woods, and I have to mention Davey Havoc, because he's the lead singer for one of my favorite bands, AFI. And of course, brain scratcher himself, John Lorden, all born in 1975. 
honestly sounds like a pretty good year. Yeah. But not not to make you nervous or anything, 1992 was also a pretty good year. You want to know why? They, I do. I do. <laughs> Tell me. Because George H.W. Bush vomited on a Japanese prime minister. <laughs> That's you what can't made beat it. that, John. That's what made it a good year, Danielle. <laughs> Apparently. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, I just I just have to tell you, because I remember when that actually yeah. happened, he caught so much grief. It was ridiculous. It was like the whole year. I mean, just comedians everywhere. <laughs> it was that story would not die down. It was crazy. Oh, my goodness. But the next one. I'm a little bit partial to Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced to life in prison. Good one. If that wasn't foreshadowing, I'm just saying mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew I would end up in the position I'm in. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs won Best Picture Oscar. Mm -hmm. And to connect to 75, Microsoft releases Windows 3.1. Now, Danielle, do you even remember? Windows like before Windows 95. Do you remember Windows 95 even? I don't I don't know. <laughs> it was a whole different world. Like the Windows that we have now is pretty similar to like Windows 95, but Windows 3.1, it was so different. It was like it's almost like BlackBerry to smartphone. It was just oh, a wow. really big change and yeah. yeah, it was crazy. Crazy different. Oh my goodness. Now, next, oh my goodness, this is a big one. A jury acquits four LAPD police officers accused of using excessive force in the videotaped beating of Rodney King that le leads, I about said leads, that's not the right word, Danielle, <laughs> that leads to the LA riots, 53 deaths and $1 billion in damage. Crazy. Wow. It was crazy. Um, yeah. And I wasn't too far. <laughs> that actually happened. The trial was going on was in, in Simi Valley. And uh, I would actually wind up living there a number of years later. But oh, wow. um, the, the riots was insane. I mean, it was just everyone was terrified. And even if you weren't close to downtown L.A. and where a yeah. lot of the bad things were really going on, you were absolutely glued to your television because the coverage of it was ridiculous. It was 24 hours a day, every day, over and over. It was I mean, it was insane. Yeah. Yeah, it was insane. Oh my goodness! I was actually just looking through some pictures of it the other day when yeah. I was researching for this, and it was absolutely mind blowing. That was another thing: the remnants of it. I mean, yeah. you you would drive through certain parts of downtown LA years later, and still, you know, that liquor store is burned out, and no one ever wants to go back there, and no one ever bought it, no other business ever went back there. It was, yep. um, yeah, it, it's one of the biggest events that I saw certainly uh, happen in my life. The next one, a little less serious, Mortal Kombat was released. Oh, now, come on, Danielle. You don't love video <laughs> games if you don't think that was serious. Mortal Kombat, <laughs> the original, which that took... That pretty awesome. It took so much money from me. We, we had a Mortal Kombat machine at our local pizza place, and it oh, just wow. sucked the quarters right out of my pocket, and I was terrible. It was John's money. <laughs> yeah, I was terrible at it, too, and that's, that's probably why it was taking the money, but it was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And then next, Bill Clinton wins the race for president. Yeah, which might be tied to the first thing. I do think that um, when George Bush got sick, that a lot of people <laughs> like the conversation of how healthy yeah. is he. And then mm. just at that event, I mean, vomiting on a Japanese prime minister. Oh, it, boy. And, and it for there was already a lot of jokes about him, <laughs> you know, Yeah. to have that one. I think it was just the final nail in the in the coffin. So, yeah. Clinton exactly. took it. But there are also a lot of great celebrities that came out of 1992. Taylor Lautner. <laughs> this really is showing. Wait, wait, wait. You said great. The time. <laughs> the time. This is <laughs> for certain ones. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I mean, he had a great Twilight and everything, but <clears throat> yeah. anyways, you know, past he's, that. he's a handsome werewolf. <laughs> yes. Kate Upton, mm -hmm. Selena Gomez. That's a good one. Yeah. Cole Sprouse. Mm hmm. I love Cole Sprouse, Demi Lovato, Nick Jonas, Ezra Miller, Josh Hutcherson, Miley Cyrus, which I think is pretty cool, and probably the best one of them all, Danielle Hallen. <laughs> Definitely the most famous of them all, Danielle <laughs> Hallen, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just, I want to bring everyone behind the curtain a little bit. Before we started rolling today, I actually needed Danielle to look at that list because I didn't know who was famous from 1992. I could yeah. look at 1975. It's like, oh, I know that guy. I know that one. I know that one. Uh, it's, it's really interesting and different when you're looking at a birth year that recent. 
you know, a great way to learn about historical events, just like the ones that we were talking about, is by subscribing to Magellan TV. What a coincidence. Today's YouTube version of Crime After Crime is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is founded by filmmakers with a passion for producing and curating the best documentary content out there. Documentaries on history, science, space, nature, and of course, true crime. It's all waiting for you on Magellan TV. Can a parachute be used as a murder weapon? Check out Parachute Murder Plot. It absolutely blew my mind and even inspired an episode of Case Cracked. Killer and the Family offers a perspective not often seen. It's a fascinating look into families of murderers that will make you think twice. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. With more than 2,000 documentaries and new content being added weekly, including 4K content at no additional cost, why wouldn't you give Magellan TV a shot? And Crime After Crime viewers can try it out for free. Visit MagellanTV.com forward slash Crime After Crime and you'll get a one month free trial. There's nothing to lose. Give Magellan TV a try for free and thank them for supporting Crime After Crime at the same time. Visit MagellanTV.com forward slash Crime After Crime today. So, Danielle, it's time for you to take us back to 1992. Let's hear your big story of the day. I feel like there needs to be some crazy time machine sound effect. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was in the middle of a movie. Well, in the 90s, they had the, the Wayne's World thing, right? They, it, it would have been absolutely perfect. Yeah. So as you guys have, you know, kind of guessed at this point, <laughs> I was born in 1992. And unfortunately, that was actually a really rough year in terms of crime. In 1992, there were nearly 2 million murders, sexual assaults, robberies, and the list goes on. Today's crime rate is actually less than half of wow. what it was back then. Wow. Something I can't even begin to think about without my head spinning. I think 91 was technically the worst, but 92 trailed. So it ended up seeming like every search I did in an attempt to find a crime to cover, I just endlessly stumbled upon some of the most horrific circumstances from the LA riots, as we've already spoken about, to a slew of serial killers and other senseless murders. Every single page was dark. The case that I picked showcases the horror that many people went through in 1992, but in true Danielle fashion, as I've grown through the years, I also wanted to showcase how, as years have passed, our advancements are starting to nail those who have since assumed they could get away with anything. And Raymond Rowe is one of those people. In December of 1992, 25-year-old Christy Marac was just starting her life. She was an optimistic, incredibly happy person that deeply cared for those around her, so it made a lot of sense when she became a school teacher. Her whole life, she would play fake school with her brother and her sister, and she constantly spoke about her love for teaching, and she ended up landing a job teaching in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which was a very quiet, very calm area, mostly made up of Amish country, where nothing crazy ever seemed to happen. The morning of December 21st, 1992, Christy woke up early as usual to prepare for the week ahead. She lived with a roommate that left at around 7 a.m. that morning, and she planned to head to work roughly 45 minutes later. She had spent the entire previous night wrapping up copies of the book Miracles on Maple Hill for her students, including handwritten notes of encouragement. That's just the kind of person she was. But she didn't ever make it to school for her class at 9 a.m. Principal Harry Goodman knew Christy was very dedicated to her job. He described her as the kind of teacher that gave you chills. She genuinely did what she loved with all of her heart, and there was no way she would no call, no show. After about five times of calling her home with no answer, Harry decided to call Christy's mom, and she was equally as shocked and concerned. Harry decided to go and check on Christy himself since she lived not very far from the school, and at this point, Harry and Christy's mother were just assuming it would be nothing more than a flat tire. But as Harry drove the route, he didn't see Christy, and when he arrived at her home to see the door ajar, he knew something was wrong. Upon entering the home, he found that Christy had been murdered in her own living room. Authorities arrived on the scene, but there seemed to be little answers as to who was responsible. There was no sign at all of forced entry, and the weapon used appeared to come from her own home. The only bit of evidence that was collected was DNA evidence from a sexual assault that was discovered on Christie and the carpet underneath of her. That was the only piece of evidence that they had connecting the killer to the crime. And keep in mind, this is 92. DNA was in its baby stages. What was it, 80? Do you know the exact date it was? 
it was late 80s when things really started. So yeah, yeah. There, there wasn't much they could do with it. They had no suspect or really any person of interest other than the principal. And that was only because he was the one to find her. Mm-hmm. But the day after her murder, something else suspicious happened, pointing them to another individual. The entire school was grieving, and a man showed up with flowers heading straight to Christie's classroom, which, again, that shows the time and place because you don't get into any school right. <laughs> anymore without going through a lot. Yeah. He ended up being stopped and was asked what he was doing, and which he replied he was a friend of Christie's and he was stopping by to see her. Red flag number one. Hmm. There was no way anyone in that small town didn't know what happened to Christy. It had rocked the entire community, and it had taken over the TV and radio stations entirely. The man was escorted from the school, and authorities were called to report this odd behavior. The following day, the same man popped up again, calling the superintendent from the school this time. Exactly. If this were me, I'd be like, whoa, whoa, done, yeah. sold, I know who did it. And well, at least he, question him. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. And he he said that he heard about Christy, he knew what had happened at this point, and that he also heard the school was offering counseling and he wanted to take part in that. It really seemed like a situation where someone possibly involved was putting themselves in the middle of the crime, which, as I said, huge red flag. Mm -hmm. But then things became more questionable because once police found out about this and spoke to him, they found out that this man was actually Christy's boyfriend, a married man twice her age. Bingo motive. Yeah. So they're thinking they have their person and they start to question him. But Christie's boyfriend and the principal that they also questioned both had solid alibis, which is great. But now authorities were led right back to square one. And imagine how frustrating it is having the DNA at that point in time. That would be something completely different today. Yeah. All they knew is that whoever was responsible was more than likely very close to Christy or knew her routine. She was a stickler for safety. And I've seen her brother talk about this. He is not kidding about it. Mm -hmm. Even if she knew a guest was coming over, even her own brother, she double checked it before unlocking the door. You didn't come in. (laughs) You know, you didn't do anything until she saw you face to face through the people or through a window. So either she was ambushed or someone that she trusted did this to her. Authorities were juggling questioning over 1,500 people that knew Christy closely. This is how popular she was. She was just that great of a person, while also trying to come up with a description of the killer and the killer's vehicle, which, interestingly enough, I was not able to find out how they were even able to do that. I didn't see any mention of a witness. I must have missed something, but I didn't see it. The DNA that was found at the scene was compared to over 60 men that were directly in her life at the period of time between 1992 and 1995. That's how long it took them to compare. And all of those people people were ruled out. So despite hundreds of initial tips and relentless searching done by police and Christie's family, the leads trickled to a halt and nobody knew what step to take next. Christie's brother, Vince, that she was very close to, started a Facebook page in 2009 to raise awareness about his sister's death and to create a space for those that loved her to share their memories. Vince also put up a billboard off of Route 30 in Lancaster, hoping to elicit more tips, but still after years, it was at a standstill. Two decades later, a fresh set of eyes were put on the case and it got the ball rolling again, and you are going to like this, John, when I say it. In March of 2017... Authorities realized there had to be more done, especially in regards to the DNA. DNA had changed, things have progressed, so they contracted work out to Paramount Nanolabs for some assistance. Mm -hmm. They had been sitting on this DNA, but without even a hint as to who to test it against, they were stuck. Paravon is a company that specializes in DNA phenotyping, which basically predicts someone's physical appearance off of DNA alone. Mm -hmm. While they didn't believe this would lead them directly to their killer, they knew it would at least narrow down the wide list they were struggling with. And they were working closely with a woman named Cece Moore, who is phenomenal, if you guys have not heard of her. She handles genealogy. And together, they knew they had a high chance of finding the killer. Only two months later, in November... Parabon came through with a few images of what the suspect would have looked like at multiple ages. They had three in total, showing the ages of 25, 45, and 55. The images themselves were relatively basic, since things like hair and the environment can directly change the way someone looks. And authorities immediately took these images and released them locally in hopes that someone in Lancaster County could lead them in the right direction. But the tips they hoped for 
didn't come in. It's and just, there's a crazy so twist to that in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it's so frustrating because you you hear about all these different avenues that they're trying. And in many yeah. cases, it's like, oh, that's the road that solves that case. That's the road that solves that case. And in this case, it goes on for decades. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. But in 2018, Parabon decided to upload the DNA sequence to GEDmatch uh -oh. <laughs> as the next step. I know that's when you know things are getting serious. Yep. Again, I'm sure most of you know, after the Golden State Killer, that's kind of what you know it's most known for. But it's a database that's kept for purposes, usually for things like building family trees, genealogy. But now, they're trying to use it to help find criminals. Anyone can voluntarily send their DNA to be added to the database. And they were shocked when it only took until the end of the month to receive some interesting news. All this time. <clears throat> all this time. Now, DNA is complicated and small markers can match without it being significant. Mm -hmm. But Parabon found a highly significant match to the killer's DNA sequence in their database. It was such a high match that the DNA in the database had to be a direct relative of Christie's killer, at least the cousin. They built up a family tree starting at great grandparents, did some reverse genealogy, and finally they landed on a specific killer or a specific family, but they still needed to pinpoint who within that family was related directly to the killer. They were able to narrow it down, get this, in days. Yeah. Like two to three days, you guys. Yeah. This case has been open for decades at this point, and in days. I think that's absolutely crazy. I'm not over it. 49-year-old mm -hmm. Raymond Rowe, and he had never been on the authorities' radar. Raymond would have been, I believe, 24 years old at the time of Christie's murder, and he had lived less than four miles away from her at the time and still lived in Lancaster. The craziest thing, however, to me, at least in my opinion, was that he looked exactly like the images that had been released. I'm Paramount. not, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan <laughs> of the snapshot product. That's the name of the, the phenotyping yeah. that they do. Um, Cause sometimes I see them and I'm like, that looks like a Sims character. That looks yeah. like if I tried to build myself in the Sims. But for that particular case, that's probably the best example that I've seen of snapshot and looking like him. It's absolutely insane. It looked so much like him. Now, yeah. if he had been an average guy, I would have been able to understand more how it was possible nobody really recognized him. Yeah. But he wasn't. He mm -hmm. was actually basically a celebrity in Lancaster, which blows my mind. So Raymond was actually a DJ that went by the name of DJ Freeze. He had his own very successful entertainment company. He had his own rental stores. He had a DJ school. People were very aware of who he was, what he looked like. He frequented all of the clubs in Lancaster County, hosted dance parties of sometimes up to 1,000 people. People would plan their weddings around him and when he was available. Yet not a single person that I know of named him as someone resembling the images released. Because yeah. he he, the authorities said he had never been on the radar. Now, while this seemed like a promising lead, they needed more physical evidence in order to arrest and convict Raymond. May 31st, just days after getting the results from Parabon, authorities set up an undercover operation to acquire some of Raymond's DNA. There was a local school dance that night that he was supposed to DJ for, and authorities were watching his every move. And right off the bat, they knew they had a good chance because they watched him pop in a piece of chewing gum and drink from a water bottle. The same gum and the same water bottle that he tossed in the trash once his gig was done. Authorities took both of the items as evidence and rushed it to the lab for forensic testing, and it was an absolute match. On June 25th, 2018, Raymond was arrested for the murder of Christy Merrick from 1992, and he was not allowed bail because he had just spent the past 26 years avoiding arrest after committing this horrific crime. Nice. Everyone was shocked because Raymond was so well known, he was so liked, yet not a single person ever would have thought he could be responsible for murder. Not only did he make sure everyone had a great time at their wedding day or while out with friends or at schools, but in 1992, and this is so crazy to me, he actually helped organize and lead an event specifically about ending violence in young adults. Mm. And then just after this event, all of this happened. The night that he did it, he slept in the same bed as his fiance, married her months later, the entire time they were together, no idea at all. She had not even the slightest idea. She even remembers after all this happened, Raymond expressed 
concerns about her safety in the community. Once the news broke, he seemed genuinely concerned about her and what she should do and how she should protect herself as if he wasn't responsible himself. Wow. On January 8th, 2019, Raymond pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison for the 1992 murder. He apologized to Christie's family in court, but to this day, not a single person has any idea why he did it. He will not say why he did it. And no one can even figure out if they knew each other at all. Yeah, it makes you wonder if they <clears throat> like met at a bar or something. I mean, I, I get the sense that she was a little bit um, social w- yes. when it came to dating and stuff like that. Yeah. So maybe they had been on a date before or yeah, that's that's really bizarre that they still haven't got that information. They have absolutely no idea. They tried to piece it together. I mean, he did live relatively close by, yeah. but I don't I don't think that necessarily means anything because I don't know people that live four miles away from me. Right. You know, and I, and I might not run into them. Uh, you know, you never know. But it's it's interesting because Christy's family, her brother in specific, spoke to Raymond during the hearing and he said, and I quote, if not for the grace of modern technology and divine intervention, you probably would have stayed in Lancaster and basked in your fame. Right. And I I know this was a crime that occurred in 92 and was solved now, but I could not get over it because I kept thinking of it in terms of, I was born in 1992 and mm-hmm. my entire life, everything that I know up until this moment, it took that long of progressing and people working their butts off yeah. to get to a place where they could solve something like that. You know, something that had destroyed a family and took someone's life. And he was just living it up that entire time. He was having a great time. <laughs> and I don't know. I just, I couldn't get past it. I couldn't get past the information and how far we've come. And oh my goodness. There's another interesting parallel to you <laughs> on this, Danielle. And that is think about all the experience that you've had in your entire life and realize that Christy didn't get that. Exactly. That this she, whole time she could have been alive and still had more life to go <clears throat> after yep. that. And all that was taken from her for a reason that we still don't know. We, exactly. We, yeah. And he he was free Yeah. after it longer than she was ever alive. Yeah. It's, abs- it's just everything about it. I couldn't get past it. Because it, it basically, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few things about this story. It's a great example of the perfect case situation for yeah. Parabon Nano Labs and their genealogy work. I mean, basically, if you remove the snapshot element about them putting out the poster, it really didn't mm-hmm. affect this case. It was really the genealogy work. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will confuse because the media is kind of crediting Parabon with solving these crimes. And there's certainly a significant component to it, but your story touched on the reality of what happens. And that is Parabon will tell the police, we think that it's this particular person or they they more, more likely state it. We know, we know it's either this brother or this brother. Then it's up to the police to actually find the DNA that matches the source DNA from the crime. And that's Mm -hmm. that very important step where they're going to follow that guy around. They're going to look for a bottle or a cup that he's using or a piece of chewing gum, and they're going to recollect it and then test that and make sure that it is a perfect match to the DNA from the crime. So yes, Parabon is providing key information that is certainly necessary to, to solve the case. But really, it's police efforts that go ahead and close that loop and then give them everything they need for prosecution to step up and and get in there. Absolutely. Because if you think about it, how often do you, you know, throw away a bottle or something publicly? I mean, Mm -hmm. I know for me personally, I never I never go out. That might sound terrible, but I don't. I'm at home a lot. I usually eat at home, drink at home. And if not, I've got, you know, my tumbler with me, my reusable tumbler, my reusable straw, and I don't leave anything anywhere well so, you you think you don't but there, there's another aspect oh, of this don't that's, get me started on touch dna and things like that well it is freak it, out. it is it's gonna get the it's it's gonna get even crazier because exactly like at crime at crime con mm-hmm. we were talking to a guy that worked with mvac where mm-hmm. essentially you could take an item like maybe a rock or something that they couldn't get dna from before if if i had touched it but then they use uh special 
a chemical, like essentially a type of water that is absolutely clean so that it's not contaminating the sample. And then they vacuum it up and then they use multipliers to make the DNA sample bigger. And then they pull that DNA and there they have the profile. So it's insane. You walking down the street. Yeah. Touching a mailbox or even just hair follicles falling out of your head. Yep. We're leaving traces of ourselves all over the place. But um, in this particular instance, yeah, that's just it's that's the perfect case for exactly. Parabon. Um, yep. There is a big change that has happened. I'm sure you know about this, Danielle. Uh, GEDmatch yeah. has actually changed how uh, law enforcement can use their information. Mm -hmm. And now you have to opt in. So anyone yeah. out there, if you're interested in helping to solve crimes and you are on GEDmatch, you have a profile there, please consider going and opting into law enforcement's access so that they can help solve crimes like this. Thankfully, I have heard of an example recently where an officer was able to file a warrant directly to GEDmatch. Yeah. And, and despite the fact that they've changed their policy, he had open access for processing his case. And the great thing about that is the framework that he used, I think it was like a 50 page letter mm -hmm. um, to get that warrant filed. He's now able to share that with other police officers and other departments, and they can use yep. that as a template for their requests and try to get that through as much, uh, much easier. Um, but also not just for GEDmatch, because if it worked for GEDmatch, maybe it'll work it for exactly. yeah, Ancestry or mm -hmm. 23andMe or all these other commercial DNA databases that have a lot more information that GED, GEDmatch did. So. It's uh, it's the Wild West when it comes to uh, <laughs> DNA solving cases. I know. I'm telling you. And, I, and you, John, I know you already know how I feel about that. I think genealogy is the craziest, most fascinating thing and how they've used it. And the fact that, you know, in 92, they, they did the best they absolutely could. They, yeah. they spent from, I think it was 93 to 95, mm -hmm. comparing DNA from just 60 people. Yeah. And, you know... It took everything. It took a whole lot. So the fact that this was able to be done and they were able to trace things back so quickly in a matter of days was just mind blowing to me. And I can only imagine where it's going to be well, and in the next 20 years. There's another name that you see attached to these cases all the time. And you brought her up. That's Cece Moore. She's yep. she's a bit of a rock star when it comes to that. There's a few names that you see that'll that'll pop up on this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's it's good stuff. And I hope they are able to continue doing that type of work, hopefully now with these warrants that are helping mm -hmm. uh, people or law enforcement gain access there. So, yep. And a huge, huge thank you to People.com and ABC 2020 for all the information on the story. ABC 2020 actually had an entire, I don't want to call it documentary, but it was like a 40 minute long video that they had on it. And they had some great information. Awesome. And you can't, I, I tried to find it otherwise and you can't really find that much about her or what you know she was like and everything like that which we all know is very important to me so i was very 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 appreciative of that do you think he's still calling himself dj freeze in the pen oh boy i highly doubt it <laughs> if i'm being right. really honest with you yeah <laughs> i no, highly doubt it no two turn tables and a microphone in there <laughs> nope all right well we will be back right after this short break some people have trouble falling asleep some have trouble staying asleep some people have trouble with both. On average, people are getting less quality sleep than ever before. I went through a real rough patch with my sleep a few years ago, and it was just absolutely terrible. It literally affected everything. My work output was horrible. My relationships were becoming strained. I didn't feel like myself, and I felt like I had no help. Tackling sleep issues shouldn't feel impossible. That's why there's RimRise. Their online survey will suggest the perfect blend of all natural herbs and aminos to help you get deeper, more consistent sleep. My blend is called Power Off. I also did the survey, really enjoyable, very quick, and I found out my blend is called Chilled Out. So <laughs> sounds like they got us both right. RemRise is a holistic sleep solution. No drugs, no groggy side effects. You can also download the RemRise app from the Apple App Store. There's also an Android version coming in 2020. The app allows me to track my mood, sleep duration, stress levels, and you can even connect it to a fitness tracker. The thing I love the most on the app is the guided meditation tracks. You guys know I'm a vegetarian. Well, RemRise is vegan and non-GMO. So do what I did and check out RemRise today. 
go to getremrise.com slash crime. Take their sleep quiz, and when you sign up, you'll get your first week of Remrise for free. Just pay for shipping. You won't find an offer like this anywhere else. Get your first week of Remrise for free when you sign up at getremrise.com slash crime. Go to getremrise.com slash crime and see how East meets West for exceptional rest. Welcome back and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. Absolutely. Now, thank you, Remrise. Exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> My sleep thanks you too. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a horrible sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> you need to power off, Danielle. I do. I'm they literally nailed it on the head. Yeah. It's time, John. Is it? Take us back. <laughs> Take us back. Wow. <laughs> I, we need the theme song again. <laughs> yeah, we might need two time machines to actually go back this far. We're going back to <laughs> 1975. Well, Danielle, obviously we cover a lot of different crimes here on Crime After Crime, but one in particular kind of terrifies me. Ooh, and interesting. That is the thought of being held for ransom. Understandable. Yeah. <laughs> now, nowadays, you're more likely to hear about your computer data being held for ransom. But back when I was born, things were quite different. In 1968, Barbara Jane Mackey, a Florida land development heiress, was kidnapped and kept underground in a coffin-like box for 83 hours. Thankfully, she was rescued by the FBI. In 1973, 16-year-old John Paul Getty III was held for ransom for five months. And by the way, in that case, they cut off one of his ears and sent it to his oh, family. My goodness. Terrible. Thankfully, he was also released. In 1974, heiress Patty Hearst was taken. She would actually kind of flip with her captors and eventually started committing crimes with them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interest that's an interesting turn of events there. <laughs> yeah. Well, 1975 was no different. You would see this trend of wealthy families being terrorized for ransoms continue. Seagram's Company Limited was once a mega successful conglomerate that started as a Canadian whiskey distillery. When they peaked in the 1990s, they were the largest alcoholic beverage line in the world and owned various other businesses, including DuPont, MCA, and even Universal Studios. Oh, wow. Some people theorize that Seagram's wine coolers may even be responsible for the conception of one Danielle Hallen. <laughs> Probably. Ask, ask your mom, Danielle. I'm pretty sure Seagram's she, wine coolers. She loves some wine, so I believe it. <laughs> Originally started by Joseph E. Seagram in 1857, it was run as a family business, but eventually another family would take it over. That family was the Bronfmans. Numerous family members would hold key positions in Seagram's over the years, and in 1975, someone wanted to exploit their wealth. On August 14th, 1975, billionaire and chairman of the Seagram company, Edgar Bronfman Sr., got a delivery to his New York apartment. It was a ransom tape. His son, 21-year-old Samuel Bronfman Jr., had been kidnapped eight days before. Sam's voice was on the tape, relaying instructions to his father, instructions that had to be strictly followed or Sam's life would come to an abrupt end. The kidnappers wanted $2.3 million in cash. Oh my goodness. And that's in 1975. That's a lot of dough. Whoa. Oh my goodness, and in cash. Yeah. I'll well, give him like a hundred. That's all I got. <laughs> Tops, I don't have any more. Oh, I don't know if it was your son. Yeah, I don't know. Luckily, Edgar was already working with the FBI. His Fifth Avenue apartment was being used as their base of operations in their attempt to get Sam back safely. Edgar was told to go to Kennedy International Airport the following day on that ransom tape and wait at a specific payphone for further details. He brought the money in small bills as they requested, and the money was in two large plastic trash bags. Each one weighed 75 pounds. It's a lot of cash. At 9.12 p.m., the payphone rang. Edgar was told to drive to an underpass near the Queensboro Bridge and wait. He got there and waited, and soon a man jumped into his car. Edgar was ordered to drive around the block while the man counted up the money. When the man was certain it was all there, he was dropped off at a street corner where another man was waiting in a 1971 rust-colored Oldsmobile. The criminals took the cash and drove off. But where was Sam? 
I was about to say, <laughs> something seems wrong here. Yeah, we're missing, <laughs> we're missing a piece to this story. FBI agents were monitoring everything going down, and they were able to get the license plate of the car. It was registered to a man named Mel Lynch, who lived in Brooklyn. 25 hours after the ransom money was dropped off, federal agents and NYPD stormed Lynch's apartment and found him and Samuel Bromfman. Sam was bound, had tape covering his mouth, a blindfold, and was disoriented, but he was alive. The first words out of his mouth were, thank God. I want to call my father. Sam was taken home where the butler broke out a bottle of champagne. Every dollar of the ransom was recovered. It was being kept under a bed mattress in an unoccupied apartment nearby. Sam would state at trial that Mel Lynch held him at gunpoint on the night of August 9, 1975, then handcuffed and blindfolded him before throwing him in a car driven by a man named Dominic Byrne. He was then taken to a shoddy apartment and held captive for over a week. Mel Lynch would tell a very different story, Danielle. Interesting. Oh, boy. Yeah, pretty interesting facts here. (laughs) Oh, no. According to Lynch, who was a New York firefighter, (gasps) the entire abduction was staged, and he and Sam were in a romantic relationship. Danielle is, her her (laughs) jaw is on the floor. (laughs) I never saw that coming, I'll tell you that. (laughs) Yeah. Mel stated that they had met at a Manhattan gay bar called Uncle Charlie South the year before and had spent a lot of time together at that same apartment that he was supposedly captured in, but they also spent a lot of time together at the pool house of the estate that Sam lived at with his family. Oh, my goodness. Mel Lynch also claimed that Sam was blackmailing him to go along with the plot that Sam was threatening to tell Lynch's boss at the fire department about their relationship if he wouldn't agree to do it. Sam's original plan was apparently to kidnap his younger brother, 13-year-old Adam. However, he changed his mind and decided it should be him instead. Mel claimed that Sam set the ransom amount and even provided them with two revolvers that were used in the fake abduction. Mel would tell the jury, quote, Sam promised that if anything wrong happened, he would speak to his father and his father would straighten things out. He said that if I had to go to jail, it would be only for a few days. And he promised that if I lost my job, I would be compensated financially. As to why Sam was bound when the feds busted in, Mel claimed that they knew that the feds were on their trail and he was literally trying to stage the scene moments before they came busting in the door. Oh, my gosh. He says that Sam's left hand wasn't even tied. He only had time to get the rope around the right one as the door was being pushed open. Of course, we know there's another man involved in the crime, the getaway driver. So I'm wondering at this point. Yeah. What's the truth? Who's telling the truth? (laughs) Yeah. We've got two way different stories here. I know, like entirely different. Right. But we've got a third guy. So we've got the getaway driver. He was a limousine driver named Dominic Byrne. Uh, He was also a neighbor of Mel's, lived close by. Um, Would he be able to help authorities understand this all better? Unfortunately not. According to Mel Lynch, Dominic was kept in the dark and thought it was a real abduction right from the start. Neither Mel nor Dominic had any previous criminal records. Now, Mel does say the night before the feds came in that he told Dominic at that point that everything was faked. But up until that point, like if Dominic was coming over to the apartment, they would, you know, tie up Sam and make it look like he was being held captive there. So Dominic did find out, but it was really, really late in the game. Sam denied knowing Mel before the abduction, said he wasn't a homosexual and that he was blindfolded and bound the entire time. The district attorney also drove at a very important point. Why the heck would Sam need money? Exactly. He was scheduled to inherit about $20 million and he was the son of one of the wealthiest men in America. The defense then introduced a sworn affidavit from a family friend of the Bronfman's. He claimed that Sam spoke to him about a similar scheme the year before, though this one was based on being blackmailed by someone that supposedly had a pornographic film of Sam. 
All right, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Is yeah, isn't this? <laughs> yep. Apparently, Sam talked to this man about that scheme at a familiar location, Uncle Charlie South, the Manhattan mm-hmm. Gay Bar. Did this family friend know why Sam would have wanted the money and wasn't able to ask his father directly for it? In that scheme, the money would have helped open a new gay bar. And he was basically offering this family friend the job of managing this new gay bar. Oh, my gosh. The family friend statement read, quote, he told me that I knew his family long enough to know how difficult it is to get cash for projects that do not totally meet the family's approval. There were also a few problems with the evidence that may show that Sam wasn't exactly telling the truth. The ransom tape was played at trial. And after a statement on the tape where Sam is emotionally pleading with his father to pay the ransom, his voice quickly changes and he appears to tell his captors, "Uh, hold on, I'll, I'll do it again. Oh, you have to be kidding me. No, and I wish I could find tape of it, but unfortunately, this is too far back. Uh, He also claimed that he was monitored by someone the entire time that he was being held captive. However, they looked at the work records for Dominic and Mel. And on August 15th in particular, they were both at work at the same time. So there was no one to watch. Oh, my gosh. Lynch and Byrne were both acquitted of the kidnapping. Sam was shocked and stunned. He stated, it's a pretty sad system when a guy gets kidnapped. The kidnappers are caught red handed and they get off. The best thing you can do is laugh about it and put it behind you and go on. Oh, yeah. Easy peasy. No (laughs) problem. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He's really upset about it, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Let's move on now. Yeah. (laughs) My goodness. Someone's had a little too much Seagram's there. Um, Exactly. Lynch and Byrne were, however, convicted of a much lesser crime, and that is grand larceny. Lynch served about six years and Byrne was paroled after five. They had already served like... A year and a half even getting to the trial so i can imagine yeah they had like i think three and four additional years tacked on after that but two jurors in particular said a deciding factor was when they examined the rope that was used to bind sam reportedly it literally fell apart in their hands and some reports say that it wasn't even really rope but more of a knotted cord that was used for venetian blinds oh (laughs) <sighs> another it's juror it's exhausting it's exhausting trying to like figure out their frame of mind <laughs> isn't it i know and, and can you imagine this guy's all nervous he's literally looking out the window he's like there's feds out there i know that they're gonna come in i need to make this look like he's really kidnapped i'm gonna grab this cord from the venetian blinds and wrap it around one of your wrists well, well, only only one <laughs> and that's it <laughs> right Uh, One other juror also reported that the blindfold wasn't exactly a blindfold, more of a simple flap that could kind of easily be flipped up. It was also reported that when the authorities entered the apartment, Mel and Sam were sitting next to each other on the couch. Oh, (laughs) every time I think this can't get even more ridiculous, it does. (laughs) Well, hold on. We're not done yet. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. So despite all of this, Sam would face no charges. There just wasn't enough evidence to prove that he had faked his own abduction. As one juror put it, and this is a direct quote, the point is that they did not have enough evidence to show there was homosexuality and the prosecution did not have enough evidence to show that there was a kidnapping. That does not mean there was no kidnapping, and that does not mean there was no homosexuality. What Sam, an interesting statement. I know, really. <laughs> I think someone I think someone took some Venetian blind cords and wrapped it around I know. someone's brain. I uh, know, because that made no sense. <laughs> Sam's father would always defend his firstborn son publicly. However, when it came time to pass on that Seagram's company, Sam got skipped. And his younger Mm. brother, Edgar Jr., wound up running the business. That seems like a good business choice. I think so. I think (laughs) so. Seems like Sam's focused on other things. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam would actually wind up marrying a woman literally just the following March, March of 1976. And her name, I'm not kidding you, Danielle, Melanie Mann. (laughs) So he wound up marrying a man. (laughs) 
<laughs> this poor guy just seems so conflicted. I know. I know. I, oh, my goodness. Um, also, of course, worth noting, some of you are probably saying, wait, this Bronfman name, I know this. Uh, a few members of the same Bronfman family are in the press recently. Sarah and Claire are Sam's half sisters, and they're part of that whole Nexium cult scandal that's been going on. Oh, boy. Yeah. This Be- family. I know it. it. I know interesting. it. Interesting. Big thank you to the New York Times, Daily Mail, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. What do you think of Sam, Danielle? I'm honestly almost like sick. He didn't get charged with anything. I understand that they, I guess, didn't have enough evidence, but that's infuriating. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm even a mother, so I feel like I can say this, but if I found out my child did that to me, you know, faked an abduction, made me feel like I was losing them, potentially, you know, I would be devastated. Yeah. Finding out it was all just some crazy, insane scheme. Oh, I would have absolutely lost my mind. There is a part of me that I I kind of, I hurt for Sam just a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you wonder about, Especially homosexuality in the 1970s. Acceptance, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like it was exactly hidden. I mean, you, you could be gay in the 70s. I'm sure it was yeah. not easy. Um, but for if, if that's really the case, and these are the lengths that he went to to have that type of relationship, and his dream was to have a place where he could be himself, there's something about that that kind of breaks my heart for him. And. I, I don't know the the history after this. I don't know if he did ever wind up coming out, if that's really part of it, or if he's, you know, he's just, no, he's not gay. He's he's married, and that's how he's and living now. But um, I don't know. The story that, that Mel tells, it, it just, it, there seems to, it, it has the ring of truth to it, and there's something about it that yeah. really grabs my heart. Oh, absolutely. I think it's devastating that he felt like he couldn't, you know, go to his family and be like, hey, look, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Could you please support it? Could I have the money for it? Yeah. But there's like a, there's still a line <laughs> yes. where you do not cross over that. And that's, I mean, ah, oh, yeah. that's a, that's rough to do to your parents. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Rough to do to your parents. And then to me, it's honestly even more concerning that he, you know, try to do it not just once, but he had attempted to do it another time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's a lot of premeditation in that. Yeah. Uh, Mel also says that Sam was so freaked out, actually, they yeah. after they got the cash, that Mel was like, okay, it's time for you to go home. And Sam just wouldn't leave. Oh, um, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and who knows what that's about. It could be along those emotional aspects. It could yeah. be him being worried about being found out when he got back and everyone's like, oh, so you're okay now. But um, yeah, I don't know. I still kind of wonder about the truths in that story and which way it actually falls. Uh, Yeah, me too. And I also find it interesting that the driver had no previous criminal record, was completely fine. And then, you know, I would understand if he was, you know, I hate to say this because it's everyone's gonna take this a weird way but it's not that i would understand completely if someone was okay with doing it if it was faked but the yeah. fact that he just seemed like so full-on like okay with a kidnapping yeah he was just like oh yeah sure like why not <laughs> it's funny you're saying that because i saw pictures of this guy going to trial and he has this big old <laughs> smile on his face oh, and no. he's hanging out with the uh, court reporter and just just big smile and it's even noted in some of the articles yeah dominic was just he was very <laughs> really happy, happy guy. yeah <laughs> That is so confusing to me. I know you said that and I was like, wait. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> criminal. Just so okay with this kidnapping. No criminal record outside of that. And yeah, it's it's crazy. Well, now that 2019 is over, Danielle, um, for the extra stories, obviously it wouldn't make much sense for us to go into other 75 or 92s. So we're going to yep. look back at 2019 mm-hmm. and touch on some of the year's worst criminals. Starting with March 2019, a man in Hackensack, New Jersey, left his car running on a snowy day, and someone else jumped in and stole it. The victim got into another vehicle and followed the robber until he crashed, and the robber took off into the snow. When police showed up, all they had to do, you guessed it, was follow his footprints, which, of course, led directly to him. (laughs) I just... 
I wish that they could solve more cases with that. I would love to see more articles that, yeah, police followed footprints in snow, found murderer. You know? I would have loved to see the look on authorities' faces, pulling up and being like, oh boy, yeah, well, but then, we know where he's at. I was also thinking about it from the other side, though. Like, let's say that you're that guy. What do you, what do, you do? You know, like you're running away. You know you're leaving prints. How do you even address that? How do you try to <sighs> shake that? <laughs> I wonder if you even thought about it. I wonder if it was just like a I panic thing of running and then he's yeah. like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is like crime of opportunity, you know, yeah. cars running, he jumps in, yep. doesn't know the guy's going to follow him, freaks out, crashes it, runs off. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Uh, let's get to another one. April, 2019, Cameron Wilson was having a bad day in Kashmir, Washington. The 13 time convicted felon was walking around his apartment with a gun in his pocket. You know, something you just do. But uh, the gun went off, piercing his groin and thigh. He ditched the gun and went to the hospital. And while a doctor was operating on him, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I can even say this, something slipped out of his anus. Oh, no. I hate when that happens. Don't you? <laughs> It was a bag of marijuana. We always do. We always have a marijuana story at the end of these episodes. <laughs> I feel now. like we do at this point. It's yeah. great. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> while he's being operated on, a bag of marijuana falls out of him. Cops showed up and searched his car, where they found a bag of meth. I wonder if he was storing that he's in the just, same place. What do you no, think? He's Daniel? just leaving goodies everywhere. Honestly, I wouldn't trust it. I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> yeah, he's like a he's like a pinata, like an illegal pinata. <laughs> But guess what, Danielle? The story isn't <laughs> over. The story isn't over. Oh, they no. issued a warrant for him. And a few weeks later, he turns himself in. You know, they're, they're bringing him in and strip searching him. And guess what happens? Another bag of marijuana popped oh, out my. of his prison wallet. This is insane. He just doesn't learn, does he? <laughs> I don't think so. He just, it's, it's interesting to me too, because they're stashed in like all different kinds of places. Don't you think like, okay, I'm going to go to the hospital. Maybe I should take this out <laughs> before I go to the hospital. I know, but then it even makes me concerned. Cause I'm like, did he just forget? How, has he forgotten before? That's uh, so dangerous. I, I mean, at least the one where he's, he, he, he's probably worried about being arrested with the last one. And he thinks yeah. that he's going to get it into jail with him. So he's going to be able to get high while he's sitting in there i guess oh my goodness i don't know danielle it's your turn this brings us to june 2019 i'm already laughing uh -oh. a woman named precious landry was wanted for a second degree murder in saint martin louisiana so crime stoppers posted a picture of her on their facebook page someone replied to that same facebook post saying and i quote that picture ugly. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> that picture's ugly. And that person was Precious Landry herself. <laughs> what? <laughs> Crime Stoppers replied to her saying, Precious Landry, you are always welcome to head over to the sheriff's office and take a new picture if you want, or you can just wait to take it when someone turns you in to collect the $1,000 reward. Needless to say, Precious wound up surrendering herself soon after. She was worried. She needed to look good for the picture that I, was taken. I guess, <laughs> you know, um, maybe don't comment on Crime Stoppers postings about you. I, I just, I wouldn't want to engage in conversation with them if I was... <laughs> Fleeing. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> That's like taking vanity to a whole new level. Like she was just really concerned about the picture that was chosen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something else. What was that? What was that quote? I need a shirt that says "That picture ugly." That yeah. picture ugly. <laughs> July 2019. A man entered a U.S. bank in Ohio and handed the teller a robbery note. The teller saw his demands and also realized the paper was recycled. When she turned it over, she found that the note was actually a notice from the Ohio Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and it not only had the man's name on it, Michael Harrell, but it also had his home address. So she gave him $206 from her till, even calling him Michael during the actual robbery. And as soon as he left, she called police. Uh, I guess they had no problem finding him because he was soon arrested. <laughs> Can I tell you, she's brave. I know to, to I don't pull even off the know, name. I don't even know if I'd have the audacity. I'd be so scared. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it because I'd be like, what happens if I say this? And yeah. he's like, ah, but she, 
she stuck to her guns, man. She's like, all right, Michael, here's your $206. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. You almost get worried about like that could have gone really sideways. I you know. know dropping that info but uh yeah apparently she, she was calling him michael yeah uh, he's a he's a he's a ding dong it seems like though so yeah I think she's, i'm glad was, she's okay <laughs> <laughs> this was taken from a list of stories uh that came they've been posted on the new york post they actually tag stories like this with a special tag i'm going to tell you guys if you want to check it out you can visit nypost.com forward slash tag forward slash dumbest dash criminals <laughs> and there you can find many more crazy crime stories. They also had ones that were uh, videos that are hilarious. You know, porch pirates that are running away with the package and their pants fall down. And oh, my goodness. All kinds of stuff. And they tag them all the time. So you could even go back to previous years and watch all kinds of wacky criminals. Well, I'll probably be spending a long time on there after this because those stories. Yeah. <laughs> That picture ugly. <laughs> Am I? Yeah, that, I picture, that picture ugly, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, you guys. So who do you think is going to win this month? You guys get to vote. I already think I know. Mm. But I'm, I'm not going to go there. You're not going to go there? I'm not. I don't know. I think this is a pretty good <laughs> one. This is, um, I think this one's pretty close. I think this is pretty close. I'm pretty sure your story blew it out of the water. Mm, I don't know. Your story is really, really good. And I like the incorporation of the modern element and the way that it was solved. Um, you know, I, I think mine hits differently in terms of a character piece. I kind of yeah. try to do that, but I don't know. We'll see what the audience likes. That's really what it's all about. And either way, they won one of the stories they liked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I think it's very interesting, though, with your story, because you don't even hear about ransoms or anything. Anymore. It really doesn't like, happen. And, and exactly. I looked at that. Yeah, I looked at that. It really doesn't happen that much anymore. Mm -hmm. There are a few cases that I saw, um, but nothing like that. Like, you know, I'm going to capture this super mm -hmm. rich family's child and then ransom them. I mean, it was really, it was a thing that was happening back then. That's why I included those notes about the other stories. It was kind of a little constant pattern of, hey, yeah. Families are going to do this. And in the John Paul Getty story, John Paul Getty was like, we're not going to pay this because I've got 12 other grandkids. And if I pay this, all of a sudden, they're all going to get kidnapped also. Oh, my gosh. I, I cannot even imagine. Yeah. I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's, it's just really a hard situation all the way around. I'm thankful that we don't see those cases happen as often anymore. Exactly. But it was certainly a trend. All right. Well, we will be back on February 1st. And of course... February is has a very important day, very romantic day. So we're going to look for the best Valen Crimes Day stories that we can for February. We hope you will come back and join us. If you guys want to find us elsewhere, you can check out our YouTube channels or across social media. You guys know there is a YouTube version of this, but we also have separate channels. You can find me just by searching Danielle Hallen pretty much anywhere. Yep. Or you can search on Lord and Arts and you will find me. If you have ideas you'd like to submit to us, you can email crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or follow us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. We are produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, we want to say a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. Our patrons always get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. I feel like you guys are basically related to me now at this point. You yeah. know so much about me. It's a great time. Plus, patrons also get a special personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help us and help others find us is to tell them. Tell them that you love crime after crime. Send them our way. We'll take care of them. And don't forget also, we have a merch store. All you have to do is go to www.teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. And you guys can get a crime after crime mug and be a winner yes, every month. Absolutely. We're all winners here. <laughs> exactly. We hope you guys have a great new year and we will see you guys next time on crime after crime. Bye-bye. <laughs>